Welcome to episode 63 of the Food Grads podcast, the podcast where we explore careers in the food, beverage, and agricultural industries. I'm your host, Veronica Hislop, a PhD candidate in molecular science and career partner with Food Grads. This week on the podcast, I interviewed Jared Kligerman, president of the Think Tank. Think Tank is a full-service communications agency providing brands with the strategic and creative tools to stand out from the crowd and connect with consumers where they consume, in-store, online, and beyond. On this episode, Jared shared with me what the Think Tank is, how they support the food industry, and the very winding career path that Jared took to get there. We also talked about small food businesses, some of the difficulties they face, particularly the idea of trust and how Toronto has a killer food founder scene. Though the episode does not end there. We brought it back around to focus on topics related to students, such as what they should be doing during their undergraduate, like how to build a network on LinkedIn, connecting with your classmates, and how to deal with the uncertainties of careers for the future. Jared is just full of so much energy and so many good things to talk about, and I really think that you'll enjoy this episode. He brought up so many topics that I think will resonate with a lot of you out there. I know they sure did for me. Well, that's it for this introduction. Let's get on with the show. Thank you so much, Jared, for coming on the Food Grads podcast. I'm happy that you accepted my invitation. I think that what you're doing is very cool and it's so important to the food world. So thanks for coming on the show. No, my absolute pleasure. Thrilled to be here. So let's just get us started and start talking about you. Let's start talking about the Think Tank. So can you tell me more about the Think Tank and what you do there? I sure can. So the Think Tank is a full service omni-channel marketing agency. Uh, So what we specialize in is really shopper marketing or retail marketing. Our goal is to create campaigns that incentivize the consumer to go and try or buy a product, essentially. So some really traditional versions of this would be your contests, your flyers, your coupons, any type of in-store communication, whether that's a POP display or one of those shelf blades. And of course, moving into today's age, it also includes digital and social and YouTube and influencers. So for us, it's really about trying to figure out what the best mix of all those different channels is going to be to to get that consumer to go and try and buy product. And we're usually measured on something tied to that purchase, whether it's a X number of units moved or somebody sign ups to a contest or entrance to a contest or coupons redeemed. We're always measured off of that versus something like a social media campaign where you might be looking to grow your audience or grow your community. Or you're going to be measured on engagement, on engagement KPI. That's kind of how we differentiate ourselves from some of the other agencies out there. Okay. Wow. It's interesting that contests are still relevant today because I think we always just now think about social media as the only marketing. It's the be all end all when it's definitely not. But I can't help love myself. Like I just think of those ones, even though I shouldn't. Oh, for sure. And you know what? Quite honestly, we all do, right? I mean, when social started picking up speed and digital, everyone jumped on board and we all loved it as marketers because it was relatively cheap. We had access to a huge audience. It was pretty easy to measure where our dollars were going and how effectively they were being used to a degree. But what we started to see in the last couple of years, what with the effectiveness of Facebook and Instagram ads decreasing since the iOS update, cookies are disappearing. We're all starting to detach ourselves from the computers again after two years of having nothing but computers and video interaction. And so what we're actually starting to see now is things like direct mail are actually becoming one of the most successful marketing tactics because we get so little direct mail. If it's a really flashy piece that's done well with a QR code to take it back online, it's really, really high. I can't remember the exact stat off the top of my head, but over 70% of the consumers actually prefer brands communicate with with them through a direct piece of mail. It also means that they can personalize that message which is so big for all of us, right? So yeah, I think we're going to talk about this a little bit later too, but I just wrote about this this morning. Quite literally, two of the big areas that people are talking about right now, direct mail being one, but also going back to a lot of the old school things. So that would be things like your local media, so your local newspapers, local radio, local flyers, and then everything you do on your commute. So again, your local radio, a little bit of podcast, your billboards and out of home because we're all commuting all over the place again. Uh, it was particularly noticeable right before the winter holidays because everyone was in their cars trying to find specialty stuff in their cars, not online. Lots of fought online, don't get me wrong, but there's a huge mm-hmm. amount of people getting in cars to go and find specialty stores because they want to talk to someone who's knowledgeable 
to ask those very specific questions that are sometimes hard to get online. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah very, very exciting times for all of us. For sure. Wow. Um, it, it's so funny how like things come and go and then they go, because you mentioned being, when I go to the apart- my apartment building, there's flyers. I'm not gonna lie. I look at all the coupons that come in because they're all food brands, like restaurants and all that. But still, I, I spend the time looking at it because I get so little of it. So it's just as opposed to my email or Facebook or any of those types of things that just get flooded with information. Absolutely. In terms of what your role is, so we do know a little bit more about Think Tank. So what is your role there? That's kind of important. <laughs> Yes. Sorry, I knew that the second part of that question. What do I do? Really important. So I get the privileged position of sitting on top of the very flat hierarchy that we have. So my job is mostly looking at agency strategy, big picture operations for the agency and business development, which to me, because of what we do, our campaigns aren't cheap. And it's not actually our dollars that are so expensive, it's the amount of media that you're buying. And a lot of print, that's the cost associated with that is very high. So most of the people I reach out to are in smaller brands, not because they need my services necessarily, but because they're the people I have the most fun talking to. And there's a lot more of them than the big brands I traditionally deal with, people like Reynolds Alcan and Dempsters and Molson Coors, all those types of brands, only so many of them. And there's a lot of me's out there trying to get that business. So I'll keep pushing for it, but that's a a really tough game to get in on. Whereas these smaller brands, if I'm able to give them the right advice or help them find the right social media agency or manufacturing partner that will allow them to go from wherever they are to a stage where in two, three years, they might be able to work with me. Mm. That's really my goal. And even if they don't work with me, that's obviously the underlying thing behind most of what I do is I'd love to work with you at some point. But quite legitimately, if I never work with them, that's cool too, as long as they succeed and are able to grow and they will get ahead, right? I'm a big mm-hmm. believer in putting it all out there, paying it all forward. And if some of it will come back to you eventually at some point, sometime. So for me, sales is really about sharing knowledge and sharing info. And what does that mean for a marketing agency and the brands I'm dealing with? It means knowing what's happening with consumers in terms of what, how they're spending their budgets when they go shopping. It means looking at what the latest and greatest in ingredients are. It means what's trending in diets. It means what technology are retailers starting to integrate into their stores and how is that going to impact both the brands in terms of placement in the store, but also all those marketing opportunities that are coming out of that. So I try to stay on top of a huge amount of topics. I'm okay at most of it, better in some areas than others. And then I try and package it up and I share a lot of that on LinkedIn, but it's also what I send to all my prospects. So, you know, I still send them the, hey, how's it going? General crappy emails we all send. But I mostly try to send something like, hey, did you see this really cool thing that's happening over in Germany with this plant-based brand? And also that to a candy brand manager here with a direct link to say, hey, you could take this element and use it. And what's really neat is every once in a blue moon, I see some of that stuff pop up in people's campaigns, whether or not it was from me sending them that email or got it on their own, who knows? But it's cool to see some of that stuff pop up. Yeah. But what's really neat is that it allows me to help show value and help show that I'm not just about taking the money and running. I really want to form a relationship and I want to help so that we get to the dollar size that I'm dealing with is trust, which is a big deal. And getting that trust isn't easy, especially among emerging brands. You know, they could jump a long way in a lot of different ways. And I didn't really understand that until a couple of years ago when I launched my own food products. We called it Wander. My wife and I launched it. Mm-hmm. We actually just crashed it, but I launched it partly because I had an idea that was cool and viable and market research told me it was viable. I could try partly because I come from a family of entrepreneurs and I, I needed it to feel good about myself to a certain extent. But a big piece was I was miss. I, finally, of course, I'd love to become the new Peter, peanut butter baron and like take over craft. Not that, that was ever really going to happen because we were so niche and specialized. But the big piece was I was missing something in in my conversations with all these founders and with these smaller brands, and I couldn't figure it out. And I mean, I have a lot of theory. I mean, I've got two undergrad degrees and an MBA, tons of secondhand experience. Like I said, 80% of my conversations are with these exact founders. I should be, and I hear all their horror stories and the battle. I hear it all. And I went into it thinking, knowing I didn't know it all. I was not that cocky, but thinking as I knew a little bit more than the average, I should be okay. And no, 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 no. I made all sorts of mistakes. But the biggest takeaway for me was I now understand so much more about how the whole ecosystem of the food and beverage EPG world operates. It's made me that much more impactful in what I share, more efficient at being able to find important trends and how that can translate to brands. Mm-hmm. And really this makes me a better salesperson and agency owner, because now I can directly relate with all these brands. And it's awesome for me is that because I now have founder in my titles, 
<laughs> all these small CPG founders and marketers see the founder first and they go, oh, okay, well, at least give you a chance to chat, which is all I need because as a, a very fun founder, and he's probably I love to pieces, mentioned when he first jumped on the phone, he goes, Jared, I look at your website. I don't think I can afford you. So like, just to put that read out there, like, I don't know if you're calling for business, but I, I can't do it. I'm like, yeah, no, 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 don't worry, dude. I know you can't afford me. This is never about me telling you. Or I just watched you go from nothing to cross Canada distribution in 12 months in pretty much all the majors. How the hell are you going to sustain that growth and make sure you get the turns? And he goes, oh, I'm so glad you asked. I mean, it's been like two hours just chatting and bouncing ideas around and like, dude, I'm going to try not to swear on the podcast. Um, <laughs> but like just bouncing ideas. And that's really all I I'm trying so hard. That's really all I wanted to do. And he's not the first. There's been a bunch of founders over the years who reached out and after a couple hours of chatting and legitimately just me trying to help them out, they go, oh man, I wish I'd reached out sooner. You go, no, it's okay. Because two years ago, you wouldn't have been able to hear what I'm telling you. I'm like, oh, you're right. I would have thought you were this cocky agency dude who was just trying mm -hmm. to tell me mm -hmm. what's best. And you just wanted to and say, no, 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 no. Now I've been through the trenches. I know exactly where you're at. Not really exactly because I didn't get so far down the, the, the line as many of them have. But yeah. I know enough to say, no, no, I, I get it. And so now they see me as a founder for the risk of the agency guys. Not there anymore, which is <laughs> awesome because it means I have so many more fun conversations. Wow. Well, it sounds like you're very, like you've really grown to be passionate about what, I mean, you were passionate before, but just growing these conversations because I think it's it's really key with what you say is trust because as a young person who's growing up during like this growing of the internet like I have so little trust in so many things like I if anyone comes out and reaches out to me I'm like I don't trust you and it's not because I want to come from that avenue I truly don't I want to trust everyone but it's just you're so inundated with things coming at you especially and then from a sales perspective if you don't know much about the topic you're you're like this person is they could be quoting me like I've never personally been in the same aspect as you, but I could imagine if someone comes at you with a quote of like, I don't know, $2,000. And you're like, is that true? Is that not true? Are you going to just take my information? Like it's, it's, it's hard to build trust. And I can imagine for founders who are also small businesses, someone who has this really passionate family recipe or just, they want to get themselves out there. It's like, how do you trust someone? So it's, it's a really important thing now. I think that's, it's a hot commodity. That's very hard to come by. It, it is especially not to throw anyone under the bus because I don't think we, anyone gets ahead that way. But unfortunately, there are a lot of really skeezy agencies out there and brokers and just, there's, there's skeezy people everywhere. And the unfortunate part is that they're the best at being able to find new founders, which is really disappointing <laughs> because it means that I assume so many people have been burned. And what I will also say, what's been really cool in the last couple of years is a lot of more veteran founders. Those who've been around the block a couple of times, maybe on their third or fourth startup, they're at a point now where they're becoming very open about sharing their experiences and sharing their knowledge. And the founder networks that now exist are amazing, particularly within Toronto and, and Ontario, across the country. There's a lot of virtual ones that I'm very privileged to be part of because of my little side business. I got to <laughs> get to stay part of it because they like me, but there's a there great ones. I'm part of a couple and they're local. I mean, we are centered mostly in Toronto and mostly in Canada because that's where most of us are. But I mean, I was having a conversation with someone on that chain who's down in Columbia talking about what they're doing down there. The founder of that group is actually someone that I think most of the listeners may actually know. Her name is Susie Yorke. She's the founder of Love Good Fats. Uh, oh, yeah. Susie's Good Fat, which is the keto and granola energy bars. And then she's now launching her new product, Better Chocolate, which she's now been sharing that journey, which has had her go down to Ecuador numerous times to go and meet the farmers and see the plant. And it's been amazing, but she's really leading the charge in a lot of these, on the particular network, she's the one who's led the charge. And it's been really, really neat because you see things in these chats like, hey, I need this ingredient. The minimum order I can get is this size. It's six times more than I need. Who needs some? Maybe we can do a bulk order together. And so you're starting to see the founders have to group together and share that knowledge to both bring costs down, T, but also to try and avoid the really easy people who have, who can get away with it to a certain extent because people weren't talking so much in the past. Whereas now <laughs> in this chat and this it's a, on WhatsApp and I think Slack as well, I'm just on Slack, you just see all the time someone saying, Hey, I just worked with this person and this is my experience. Don't use them. Like it's becoming just as common to see that as it is. Hey, this person's awesome. And it's a big trend on, in, on TikTok right now as well with a lot of influencers not promoting a brand, but negatively said, like, you will have to buy a brand. Just read wow. that last week of the new trend popping up on TikTok. I'm not a heavy TikTok user. Yeah. Not MySpace. 
but this is what I hear. And because I care about trends, this is a big one though. But they're warning brands to keep an eye on TikTok to watch out for negative news. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Wow. I you see this is, you know, we, we talk about beginning with going back to non-digital things. And then sometimes it can be so easy to think about how bad technology is. And this is a conversation I have with people. Social media is bad. This is bad. You know, it's ruining us. And to a certain extent, I definitely agree. There's way too many distractions. There's all that. But then when you look at the cases of what the whole idea of technology, in my opinion, was to start these social medias, was to have a more connectedness, to have this more sharing of information. It's like, I didn't even know that this existed. So like, this is really cool to hear about because I think that we need to have more communities and such. And I could imagine being a founder can be a very lonely road, especially when you're you're not in that space. So to connect with others and just, that's amazing. That's really all I'm getting at. Yeah, it's really it's, amazing. It's, it's really amazing. And to, just because I know who our listener base it is, um, if you're thinking about starting something and you're scared to do it, first of all, just do it. Do your research, do your research, and then do some more research and make sure you know your numbers. Dear Lord, know your numbers. But beyond that, just start. Because I can tell you the vast majority of founders behind some of the fastest growing brands that you might be consuming have zero previous food experience, zero previous consumer product good experience. They typically come from tech or from engineering, from industries and, and jobs and occupations that have zero bearing on what they do now. And they managed to figure it all out. And that's what's so cool about technology and social media is that you do have these communities and you do have this wealth of resource at your fingertips as long as you're able to set your own ego aside, admit you, you did a whole ton you don't know, and just go and ask questions and be very humble. And if you start doing that on LinkedIn, it's the only social platform you'll find me on. I'm on all of them. The only one to find me active on is LinkedIn. And the big reason for that, besides it's my sales tool, is that the community there, especially for founders, is unreal. It is so supportive. And all you have to do is spend a few minutes every day building out your network, asking questions on in people's, in the comments of people's posts, and then sending direct messages and asking like, honestly, legitimate questions, not the boo-boo crap that I sometimes get of, oh, I'd love to pick your brain about nothing. Like, no, 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 just tell me what you want. I'm trying to launch my business. I have some real questions around packaging, or I'm having a really tough time understanding how this works. I'd love to get your two cents on it. I would say confidently the vast majority of founders you reach out to, assuming they have time, will absolutely take the time for you. And if they don't respond, don't like you think they're sh- like trying to give you the cold shoulder. It's legitimately that most founders don't have time to respond to the point that I just got a response back to someone who I know very well, by the way. Beyond the fact that they're a founder, I'm a founder. We're pretty good friends. Known them for a number of years now. It took them three months to respond to my message. And you're like, oh, you're doing fine. It's like, I'm so sorry. I'm like, no, no, I get it. You went through holiday season and now we're ramping up for the trade show season. We're good. Just want to make sure you're alive and good. But yeah. So don't take it personally. Don't be a pain in their butt, but definitely follow up and show that you're legitimately interested. And, but by all means, get on LinkedIn earlier, sooner rather than later. Start building that network, start asking questions, but just do it get started because there is a network to help. That is really good advice. And thank you for taking uh, responding back to, I could have maybe been a generic message. Sometimes for me, when I'm messaging out, it's not, I'm not super specific. It's more, I'm so shy to do it, which you would think I wouldn't be after doing this podcast for so many episodes, but I try to be mindful of people's time. I, like you said, founders are busy. A lot of professionals are busy, but Mm -hmm. I think the fact that someone actually messaged you after three months just goes to show that they care enough to actually remember to say, hey, I want to message you back because I've also learned at how good the community is. I I don't particularly know about the founder community, but I can attest to the food safety community. It's amazing. Like there's just like they're sharing like, hey, I'm looking for a HACCP plan to do this. Who can I talk to about this? And it's just, I just, it's amazing to me in that. But I want to come back to you. And you mentioned about people not going into the food industry without having a background. So I wanted to know how you decided to go into this marketing space, because I know that you have a degree in, I think, biology, if I'm not mistaken. So I, do. I want to kind of know the pieces to how you got there. All right. I will tell you that story. And just before I jump into it, I just want to highlight one thing that you and I have just both said. I think okay. reading between the lines, both of us are what would classically be defined as extroverted introverts. I think that's fair to say the two of us, mostly introverted, but once we get out, we're having a good time, reaching out to people, cold call, really awkward, tough time. Yes. So there we are, the two of us, recording a podcast, didn't know each other beforehand, shot a couple of messages, and this is the result. So to everyone out there, hello, here are two introverts who, can, who are showing that it is doable. Get <laughs> out there, go do it, send the message, send a follow-up. Yes, absolutely. 
get out of your own way. It's so awkward. It makes me sweat every time I do. What got me to where I am now in a very roundabout way. I linked it back, did it for you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so I wanted to be a veterinarian, always had a deep love of animals. Um, grew up in a very food oriented and health oriented household. So ended up going to do my biology degree and realized very quickly that I was not going to have the grades required for veterinary college, nor did I want to deal with animals and really bad pet owners have being a pet owner myself. So I kind of pivoted around and ended up doing a second degree while I was there um, in neuropsychology. It's actually an honors bachelor of science in neuropsych, which I graduated with distinction on that one, doing uh, my honors, looking at the effectiveness of energy drinks on attention, uh, reaction time, and memory, short-term memory specifically. Very cool research. Got to work with some really neat people. So I did all that, tried to get into clinical psychology, which... Um, if you're not trying to get into it, you might not know this. It is the most difficult program to get into in North America. At least really? it was when I was trying to get in. I think it still is. Worse than vets, worse than medicine. Yeah, it's it's hyper competitive. Because I, I think there is uh, there's a certain thing, particularly within my generation, where everyone got really fascinated about mental illness and trying to, to figure it out ourselves. And there's just a lot of people who wanted that pathway. Uh, it was really competitive, so I tried to apply for two years in a row. Uh, second time, I was taking interview calls while I was traveling in Southeast Asia. It was really wild, but didn't get in. And that was really disappointing. Um, at that point, this is going to age me quite a bit. So at one point in Ontario, we had a grade 13, also known as OACs, which will be completely foreign to many listeners, which is <laughs> great. Uh, but what it meant is that when we got rid of that grade 13, we ended up with a double cohort of students coming out of Ontario, going in, heading into the university here. I fast-tracked high school to skip out on that. So I got out a year ahead of it and then ended up doing a second degree, which put me back into the double cohorts. And then I didn't get in for two years. So now there's just a huge number of candidates ahead of me. We're better. So I said, this is not going to work. So I, uh, I turned to my father. He like a, was, was an entrepreneur. I said, hey, dad, I am into one of your businesses. I don't care which one. Just find me something. And he looks at me and I, this might be my memory playing tricks on me. But I swear, he said, why the fuck would I hire you? Sorry, the only F-bomb I'll drop on this entire podcast, I swear. But my jaw kind of dropped because my dad doesn't swear either. I'm like, what, what, what do you mean? I'm your oldest son. Like, I did the schooling thing like you're supposed yeah. to. Uh, just nothing panned out. He goes, yeah, but you have no business acumen. Like, you got a little bit from doing stuff, but nothing real. So go to your BCom and maybe we'll talk then. And I said, the hell, I'm doing a third bachelor degree. Master's or bust. So apply to go do my MBA, which took me to Shulik. First day of orientation of Shulik, I met this guy, Mike. Keep that name in mind. Okay. they will come back into the picture later on. But also right around that first week as I started classes, I became very good friends with one of my professors who just shared a bunch of things in common. On breaks, I'd go and hang out with him because we, he smoked at the time and I don't smoke, but I can if I have to. And so that was our excuse. Um, so I got in really tight with him. And as summer approached, I was like, hey, Stephen, you know, I'm having a really tough time finding work. I'm not asking you if you need to get me a job. I'm just, if you know anyone who happens behind in and around the management consulting, learning and development space, I'd love an intro. So he ends up introducing me to a guy by the name of Greg Witz. Um, unbeknownst to me at the time, Stephen and Greg have been friends for years and years. And Greg's been on Stephen's case for just as long about sending him some smart shoe kid. So apparently I'm like one of the only ones he's ever sent. So I basically had had the job before I even walked in the door. Not did not at the time. I did the interview, sent the thank you card as I walked out the door, all that good stuff, got the job. And so I was there for a little over seven years, started off in a technology division they had running that. So we were the leading Apple training and company, uh, leading Apple training company in Canada and one of the top three for Adobe, Ableton, Avid, Maxon. Oh my goodness, I'm missing a couple too. It's been a while, yeah. but all the tech stuff. So I helped bring in the certification, get the trainer, it's a whole shebang. We spun that off. Um, and sold it. Uh, and then I went back into the leadership management training side, which obviously is much more aligned to my academic background, where I was doing R&D, white papers, course development, business development, marketing, all that jazz. And so I was there for about seven years. Um, and I was kind of, um, I kind of hit a ceiling. I wasn't really advancing myself anymore, but it was very comfortable, very comfortable. But I was kind of looking very soft of something new. And right around then is when my friend Mike, you might recall, that day one of my MBA, he and I have stayed friends since that day. And we've become very close. Tried to open a couple of businesses together. Uh, and he calls me up about six years ago now, five and a half years ago. He said, hey, I'm thinking about maybe buying this marketing agency, but I don't want to run it. He's in finance. He's at uh, one of the big banks. Um, but, uh, you know, we've tried to do stuff together. You know how to grow a business. I like the way you operate. Uh, come run it for me. <laughs> Excuse me? You want me to do what? Like, sorry, back up. Yeah, come be the president of this agency. I'm like, 
oh, okay. I mean, I know like this much about marketing yeah. at this point and like even less about CPG or like shopper marketing, the thing you specialize in. But I said, yes, like the crazy fool I am. And so fast forward to five and a half years later, here I am still at the helm of the think tank. Very fortunate that I have the two VPs I do because without them, I, I could not do this job. Um, but that's kind of how I got here. So the big thing and the big takeaway here is, you know, it's all about networking. It's all about pushing yourself out of your comfort zone and meeting people. And um, the number of times that I would want to say no to going to some networking thing or going out for dinner or for a drink to catch up with someone and force myself to do it all paid off because it meant I stayed super close with Mike, um, who ended up getting me into marketing and CPG, which I absolutely love. I have a huge passion for it. I didn't realize I had until I got into it. Um, and just by networking and being open to the opportunities, let me, it's my entire career. My entire career comes down to networking, knowing people and being open to the opportunities and saying yes, when they present themselves. And so if you want to take away, if you're looking for your next job, I'd take <laughs> that one. You got to apply, you got to do all the late work too, but it's so much about who, you know, and, and having those relationships and as introverts, you and I yeah. really tough to do. Um, the hardest part for me, I think it might be for you too just from talking to lots of introverts, is the keeping in touch with people is really hard. Most remembering to do it is mm -hmm. my bigger issue because people, if they're not in front of me, like, they're, yeah. they're not, they yeah. don't need them necessarily. So why are they top of mind? Um, I actually now have it written into my calendar as appointments. Certain sets of friends, certain sets of business people, um, as well as my whole yes. CRM set up for sale. Um, but I literally have it put in and some of my friends, um, I've reconnected and rekindled some long lost friendships because I put them into my calendar. So they popped up on Facebook one day or some nonsense like that. I'm like, oh, why did we stop talking? Like we really had a great time. Literally put it in your calendar. It's the best thing you can do. Make an appointment because it, it pops up and gives your mind. It's like, oh yeah, I have to message all those people. It'll live. Great. So I highly recommend doing that as well. Wow. That's, um, that is a very good story in terms of like how knowing people just makes a difference in being genuine as you go along with it. Like don't burn bridges. And I'm very happy to hear you oh. say how you deal with like uh, people because I feel like I kind of do that too. In order, I don't have the extent of calorie in there, but like there's a lot of people where I want to give them all of me. And then I feel like I'm like, I, it's either all or nothing with me. And I know that's not a good mentality to have because I'm introverted because I I want to have the most genuine connection. I don't want to just like do off message. Like I want to like be all there, but yep. then it just takes so much energy out of you. And you just wish that you could have full energy, oh. like 24 hours a day, no sleep, just keep going and just right? live life. But it doesn't oh. work that And the worst part is, is when you, if you pour all that energy into the wrong relationship and they don't return yeah. any of that energy back to you, you just get so depressed and then you get bitter. My wife and I are very similar in this way. And so it's a constant actually reminder, her, like, look, you have to understand that for most of our friends, they're not here and you're not busy their lives. If you want that relationship, you're the one who has to take the effort to maintain it and give it life. And is it frustrating that it has to be you? Mm -hmm. yeah, of course it is. But at the end of the day, what's more important? You being a little put out that you've got to take five seconds and say, hey, it's been a while. How are you? We should catch up. Or sitting there being bitter about the fact that you know, they never reached out to me and you don't have anyone to talk to. Make your pick. Let's go do the thing. But yeah, literally, you know, you, you learn the more you do it, the better you get about giving little bits of energy. And then when it gets you turned back, then you can pour it all in. And that's so much more rewarding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm actually doing that on LinkedIn right now. This is one thing I'm I'm liking about getting older, even though by any means. But I'm learning these things as I get older, just with experience. You know, you ha I've seen my progression since I started university as an undergrad. And, you know, I'm doing my PhD and I've just seen... Like, how did I do that before with that much energy? Like, and I've just become more accepting of myself, but it's, um, you know, like you said, you got to put energy into relationships. And I like hearing about good work relationships, like what you're talking about, because I feel like there's a lot of negativity in the world when it's coming to work in general. And fair enough for many respects. I understand, mm -hmm. you know, some companies do not treat people properly, but sometimes I do wonder how much of it is what people are giving into their own work relationships and the people around them. like. I, I wonder, and I'm not, again, there's bad work situations, but I just wonder, is it just their self-perception or is it the workplace itself? Like, I don't know, just putting that out there. Yeah, yeah, and, and honestly, coming from the world of management consulting and developing corporate cultures and all that wonderful, fun, soft skill stuff, it's a blend. Yeah. It's really a blend, you know? They have an amazing corporate culture and you just don't jive with the energy of your manager. And it makes your life miserable. 
And the reality is, look, is the court company culture great? Sure. Are you happy? No. Oh, okay, good. Sometimes that happens too, right? Mm-hmm. So I think it's definitely a blend. Some of it's going to be the culture. Some of it's going to be your own personality. And I mean, I hear it all the time. People who go into jobs be like, oh, it sounded so great. And the culture sounded awesome. And everyone sounded so amazing when I got in there. It just didn't jive with me. I'm like, yeah, but the job was good. Yeah, the good was exactly as described. My role was as described. Just the feeling wasn't right once I was in. It happens. Okay. You know, it doesn't jive, it doesn't jive. Yeah, I think it's a bit of both. Uh, yes, it, and that's, you know, something I learned getting, because, you know, when you're new to the world, the workforce and all that, you like, you just don't know, really. And you, it's hard to articulate in your words. Mm-hmm. You're like, is it me? Is it, is like you said, is it the company? Is it maybe just your manager? Maybe you've had a different manager. Everything else would be good. But I guess that's the parts of growing up that you just kind of have to learn, which kind of sucks sometimes. But in hindsight, it's always good for you. <laughs> It is, it is. And it's also why it's great having a little network around you too of people who are in the same stage you are. So it means you can ask them, right? Hey, so what's it like at your company? Oh, oh, it is like that. Okay, cool. It's not just me. It's just, or it, it's the, this is what we're all going through. It's just a stage we have to get to. Cool. Peace of mind. Or, ooh, no, you're saying that's weird and you're saying that's weird. Maybe this is weird. Maybe I should take some action about that. Right? Again, networking, worth it. Well, um, if you were a student, like I know we were talking about like, like let's just say you were you know, let's say in your position, you know, you're in a biology degree, you don't know what you want to do, and you're looking to start networking, but you don't even know where you want to go. Like, what would you suggest tangibly would be a good step to just start networking? Like, what would be the first steps that you would do? Okay, Uh, first and foremost, find out where all the peers in the industries you may want to be joining hang out. So I default to LinkedIn, but I also recognize that as much as it is starting to see more of the science community moving on to it, it's not necessarily the place. I don't know where it is for science because I'm too disconnected from it these days. Mm-hmm. But LinkedIn's a good place to go. Um, and for that, once you're on LinkedIn, the way I like to do it is think about what industries you might be interested in going into and find who the thought leaders are because the thought leaders are always on LinkedIn. doesn't matter what the industry is, they're going to be there. So go and follow them. Don't try and connect with them because reality is they probably won't. Uh, I mean, you can try, but you know, follow them at the least. And then every day, go through and see what the comments are on their posts. And as you go through, you'll start to find other people in who are new to their career, experts, people having counter opinions. And as you go through, start to connect those people. So go to their profile, read through their profile, through what they've posted recently, and go into a couple of their posts and find a couple that are really interesting to you like like react to them so the like comment or love whatever the emoticon is and then leave a genuine comment about either what you've learned or what you liked about it or your own two cents on the matter do that a couple times and then go and connect with them and then they'll respond to you i almost guarantee you they'll respond to you because there's so much activity on their profile from you they're, they're going to notice you but i would just do that it, it doesn't matter if they're big small famous doesn't make a difference treat everyone the same with respect and and you know <laughs> as a professional but if you do that every day where you're spending you know, 30 minutes to an hour every single day, just going through and connecting to people and reading about what's going on, that will be huge. If you do that for a month, you'll have a, I mean, your network will be massive in the span of a month. Mm-hmm. It'll be exponentially larger than it is now. And from that, you'll start to see what everyone's posting and you start to get insights about what's actually happening in the industry. It's really tough to keep up with what's going out in the big wide world when you're in the school a little bit different if you research mm-hmm. because research is very out there when you're a student a non-research student in particular, in particular really tough yeah. to actually know what's going on in the industry i even say having a number of friends who are now working for uh department of natural resources and things like that along their way so even even the research ones you know until they got out there and were actually in the workforce they didn't really know what they were going to do with their degree because you can't always see all the options and let's mm-hmm. go out to job boards all the time and trying to read what's out there so that's what's neat and the other thing is too some of these jobs only get posted a couple times only so many of them uh one of my old students ended up becoming a trainer a dolphin trainer for the u.s navy uh, okay you're never going to hear about that job no. while you're doing your degree sorry you're just not but if you're part of these communities and you start if you start getting fascinated about you know the cognitive abilities of um you know, dolphins that could lead you down a path from just hearing about things. You'll start seeing the trainers commenting and interacting. You're like, oh, who is this person? And then you dig into it and not even discover these things. And I wish 
I spent more time doing this when I was in late high school, early university, the first few years of my under, couple of years of my undergrad, because the number of jobs that I now know about this many years later in my life would have put me on a drastically different path. Oh, maybe not that so drastically, but a very different path mm-hmm. potentially than where I am now. So I had to get on LinkedIn, start checking that out, um, start getting up to date on what's happening in the industry. So there, every industry has an association and at least one newsletter, if not like four or five. I'm not talking about the experts in the industry. I'm talking about the industry association. And the reason you want to get those is that it does all the, all the gathering of all the latest and greatest for you. And so it can make it really tight. So, I mean, I get, because I'm following like eight different industries and all sorts of different categories, I probably get like two dozen different industry newsletters daily. So you can get really niched down too. Um, yeah, it gets really crazy. But I would say, you know, pick two or three. And as you start to fine tune what you want, set up Google alerts for it too. Because that way, anything that might not get caught in the, in the industry news because it's too small, might, uh, but might still be interesting to you, you'll catch that to your Google mm-hmm. alerts. So that's going to help you get stuff. It's also going to help you create content for LinkedIn because then you know what's trending and what's going on. Maybe you have, you're going to have opinions about all that. And that's what you share on LinkedIn, right? Like it all kind of works together. Yeah. And the last piece I would say is whatever city you're in. Okay. You know, I, I'll specify city because small towns obviously have fewer opportunities to meet like-minded folks, whether that's founders or marketers or engineers or water inspection people who I was actually just at one of their network gatherings not so long ago. Very bizarre. Lovely people. Totally not my space. Though they meet up, right? They meet up in person. We're doing things in person again. It's very exciting. Uh, and I'm a big fan of it because the big problem I have with all the online networking meetups is that your ability to actually properly network with everybody else isn't very good. In person, you can bail out of conversations, go and meet 20 other people. You have to like try and wait for someone else to skip you to the next room. So there's a lot out there. So I'm, I'm in Toronto. You're in Toronto. I'm going to guess that probably a lot of your listeners are in Toronto too. So I've got a couple of TO centric ones to go to, but there are other ones in other cities. Actually, one that's global. So I was on it's global. Okay. I said I wasn't going to swear again on this podcast, but it's part of the name. So sorry. Cup Nights. Amazing. It's a global organization. Each chapter is owned by its own founder. So I know the one for Toronto and Waterloo. Her name is Mark Drucker. He's awesome. But the whole concept behind Cup Nights is they have three professionals, usually founders, but sometimes they're marketers or IT folks or someone who's quite senior and along in their career. They come in and they have 10 minutes and 10 slides to share how they royally, royally fit up and what they learned from it. And that's it. There's no pitch. There's no, here's how I'm successful. It's here's where I went wrong and what I learned from it. Because they and I and many think you can learn way more from how somebody went wrong than what they did right. Getting things right is circumstantial. Getting things wrong, we have all made that mistake mm-hmm. or could make that mistake. So it's avoidable. So it's a great one to go to. The room is awesome to network with people. It's lots of young folks who are figuring out what they want to do next. Lots of soon to be founders, lots of new founders. There's usually at the end of an opportunity for the audience to go up and do a quick 30 second pitch. And a lot of those are people saying, Hey, I'm developing this and I'm actually looking for this type of person to help me out or to come be a yeah. co-founder. So a neat place to go check out. Um, and then in Toronto, Tech TO is still running. Mm-hmm. Um, they used to have retail TO and marketing TO. I don't know if they sell all the subsets, but they're amazing. And again, they get the families in the latest and greatest within technology. And so it goes across all the different subsets, but really neat, great room to be in, good energy. And again, lots of people who just want to talk and meet people and bounce ideas around. So yeah, I'd get out there, seek them out and try and find those neat opportunities to connect with people. And even if it's a topic that's a little bit adjacent, like I sometimes like going through Eventbrite and just typing in the city and like CPG mm-hmm. or food and just kind of seeing what pops up. And every once in a while, there's a kind of random, funky looking event. I'm like, oh, I'll go check that out. Ensemble is a really great series. I don't think they're back yet. Um, but I kind of got into them. So yeah, I would get out to do some events within your industry, just with no purpose other than going to learn. Right? That's the best thing. As long as your ad is going to learn, yeah. you'll get every meeting you could ever want. The second you say you want a job, is when all the doors start closing. So use this opportunity to go and learn and meet people. That's true. That's um, one thing I regret when I was networking when I was a student. I was so stressed about getting a co-op position and getting a job, which I know I shouldn't have been, but you that's do. like the only thing in your mind because you feel if you don't, you're going to fail out of your entire university and all that. And I just regret going to the networking events with that in mind. And I know I probably came off as like needy, which I wish I could just like yell at my old 
like younger self, like, don't do that. Like, get out of your head. And which made it worse because I was already scared to be there oh. to begin with. That was right. That was oh, regret. me too. Right there with you. And you know what? Just because you just brought that up. And I'll say too, my biggest regret to my entire academia, MBA included, is that I didn't get involved enough with the school's activities. Get to know your peers or crying out loud. Use me as the example. I didn't. So I'm now reconnecting with people like years after you've graduated. And it's awesome, but it's such a pain because these are people that if I had gone and joined the clubs or did the case competitions or hung around for drinks afterwards, but I didn't because I wanted to get home. I just didn't have to give you a good reason. I, my introversion kicked in. I'm like, no, I don't, I don't want to be here. I regret that all so, 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 so much. So take the time, get to know your classmates, go to the, in the departmental gathering. Oh, if you can manage to squeak into some of the alumni events as a volunteer, great thing to do too, by the way. Yeah. I've met some amazing students now through, because they're volunteering at alumni events. Okay. Because uh, so I go back to alum. So it's really, it's a great way to do it. It's a really neat way to do it too. Yeah. It's good to hear that it, it wasn't just me. I try to hide it too. Like I wish, like I'm almost ashamed of myself. I don't want to tell other people that, well, I guess I am now you're inspiring me. Here I am. <laughs> that when I was, I was younger, I was like, I, I need a position. I need a position. And I really wish I wasn't like that. I wish I could have, and I would have just had a better time if I just genuinely came for talking and all of that, because I think that we're doing a career podcast and all that. And, and it's just, there's always this pressure that you need to be at the next step before you're even at the next step. And you just want to enjoy the time you're at. And I feel based on what you're saying that if you just build relationships and just be like a good person, of course, you have to put the work and build the skills and all that. Like you can't just get alone at networking that you just have a funner time and it's more enjoyable life and, and, and the doors will open rather than you because people pay attention that when you don't realize that's something I've really learned throughout my old journey. Oh, big time. Yeah. It's, um, you know, you say something and, and someone has brought it up before and I was like, I don't remember even mentioning that, but. It was really nice to hear them say that. Yeah, for, for sure. And, you know, I think you really have, I've just said a real gem there, which is slow down, enjoy where you're at. You know, the second you get out of university, the, you don't think you have it easy right now. You think, you know, exam, what are we, we're February, so we have to get, depending on your school, you're going to exam shortly. Um, you know, you might start starting second semester in some, if you're a high schooler who's really eager and listening in on this, which is good for you. But the reality is once you exit school, everything you thought was hard, yeah, it, it wasn't because then you enter the real world and then you got the real factors and you have to perform and you have crazy metrics to deliver on. And, and even if you end up in the most, in the field that you care the most about your dream job, your first few years are a grind because you're learning still, but it's a different type of learning. That's huge pressures on you. Mm -hmm. Then you also have to pay all your bills and do all the other crazy stuff because now you're an adult, you're not a student. So really, especially if you're in your first couple of years or you're on a career path, but you know, you're doing a master's in particular in your know, later years, take the time to enjoy the school and the network that's there, the opportunities that exist there, because it's something that I, I can tell you so many of us who are on the introverted side or who were trying to work their whole way through. Cause I held at least one job, if not two, my entire time through undergrad too. And for my MBA as well, actually, it really, you, you think you're doing the right thing at the time and it makes things a little bit easier on the cap side for sure. But looking back, you're like, oh, the number of friends I could have had, connections I could have had, opportunities, networks, like opportunities to advance and have great unique experiences and memories. You don't get the two, sh two shots at this. So if you're still in that, take the time. Because the reality is when you get out, it's still going to be just as competitive as mm -hmm. it is now, <laughs> right? Like if you're not going to get the job now, you're not going to get in three months. So take the three months and enjoy yourself and then apply. Well, one of the things that related to what we're speaking about, because I wanted to flesh this out a little bit more, but we won't have the time, but we talked, wanted to talk about uncertainty. And I think one of the reasons why I was so caught up in trying to get that co-op position or trying to get that job was I'm just, the future is so uncertain. I'm like, if I get that job, then I have mm -hmm. some kind of belief in my head that I'm going to be okay for a year, two years, or, you know, I'm going to get my degree. Is there any advice that you would give in, in terms of dealing with uncertainty, especially from your um, field? Marketing changes, I swear, within every like two months, even though it's short periods of time. But what would you say Ugh. dealing with uncertainty? I deal with so much uncertainty. And really, if you look at the last three years, I think we all need to come to terms with the fact that there is no such thing as certainty on the long term or on the relative short term, relative long term, that kind of middle term, because even looking at what's going on in the world right now, even if we snap our fingers and every, we get peace everywhere and things kind of start to stabilize, 
you're still looking for, you know, it's going to be eight months to a year until things return to what they were before, and they're never going to be there. And then something else could happen. One thing I think we can all take away from these last couple of years is how interconnected we are now. And how one thing happening on the other side of the world has massive ripple effects. Like the war in Ukraine has caused numerous DPG brands I know to shut down. It's like, what? The war is causing that? Yeah, because it's caused their freight costs to go up 30%. It's caused the ingredient cost to go up fivefold. You just had see all these like ripple effects go through. So uncertainty is definitely something that happens all the time. You know, you mentioned marketing changes all the time. It does tech changes all the time. You know, we're dealing with the metaverse now. Uh, we're talking about VR, we're talking about all these new, fun, flashy, exciting new things. How do you pick what ones to invest in, to go spend on, to throw out all your, you know, put everything behind? Same with your career. Do I do this job or do that mm-hmm. job? I try, like, you have all these choices. So I think the way I like to handle the uncertainty is that there's always going to be a certain number of known factors, right? We always know that something is working or that we have a certain strength area that we can lean into. So whether it's you're looking for your career or you're doing your marketing or anything else, the 80-20 rule is a good one to follow for almost, for a lot of things in life, I find, why it's used so frequently by so many people, but it really holds true. So I think, you know, I kind of run the course of 80%, maybe 90% if you're dealing with smaller budgets as a startup. I'm talking more around how you're going to spend your cash when testing out new retail partners and new marketing initiatives. Um, but a 10 to 20% of your resource can be used to test the uncertain. So that new thing. Sorry, before we continue on, could we just talk what 80-20 for those who might have not heard it before this term? Oh, yeah. So, yeah. So, so the 80-20 the rule. So funny, I actually don't know the whole history behind the 80-20 rule, but the 80-20 rule basically states focus on the 80% and 20% is kind of the extra stuff on the side. So if you're trying to please an entire audience, focus on pleasing the 80% okay. and you get the majority. So that's basically what it is. So if you're looking at a whole pie, you have an 80-20. So how you can use 80% one way, 20% the other. And the 20% is usually the higher risk side of it, although not always. Again, it's applied to so many different things and so many different capacities. But it's basically looking at if you have 100% of something, if you follow 80-20, 80% going towards the more certain option, it's the safer play, because 20% is the high risk. So when I'm looking at you know things like the metaverse, is a great example for my, me and coming out of my industry, it's a real unknown right now. People are dumping tons and tons and tons of cash and time and resources into it. And if you're a big brand, you can do that because it's also expected and you can get some ROI and play with it. But if you're a small brand, it's a risk. So do I think you shouldn't place it at all? No, I don't think that at all. I think you should absolutely be following it. And, and at the very least, you as an individual will be playing around in the metaverse. Maybe not your brand, but you need to understand what's happening there to the point that Five years ago, when I first started with the agency, I took my entire team out to have an afternoon playing at a VR arcade. Not because I, like, if the team built things, it was fun, but underlying that, and they all understood this, was if we're about to start pitching 360 video and VR and AR as part of our campaigns, which we do, you have to understand where the tech's at, what it's like to work with it, how you feel when you're in it. You need to have that full experience, kind of going... Uh, maybe we actually we didn't talk about this on this call, but you know, I'm a big believer that you have to experience something if you're going to be giving advice on it. Theory and secondhand knowledge only take you so far. And so something like VR is why we took ourselves out there. So um, when I, the way I handle uncertainty is when I start feeling really panicked about it, is I lean back onto the foundations of the certainty. So I know I have this skill set. I know that these skills are always going to be in demand. I know I want to work with this size company. And so as long as you go back to what you know you want, it will allow you to figure out where you want to go forward. So, you know, applying to jobs is this real, you know, I don't like using gun terminology, but we used to use the whole machine gun or shotgun Mm -hmm. approach to to resumes. Um, You know, maybe not so much the younger generation, but, you know, definitely for myself and I think you as well, you know, we used to hand out resumes left, right, center, just like hammer them out, you know, digitally was even worse. You could hand out hundreds of resumes at the time. Uh, and it just doesn't work anymore, right? Because the reality is there's just thousands and thousands of us all applying for that same brand manager job at Nestle or whatever, you know, the food tech at this place or the R&D person. There's only so many of those positions. And so, you know, one of my big pieces of advice, because that's a lot of uncertainty. Where am I going to get my job? What am I going to do? I don't know. Is, you know, don't rely on anyone. You know, you're going to have two or three different jobs that you really like. And the reality is, particularly for your first job, maybe even your first two, they're stepping stone jobs. They're not going to... be the odds of you getting one that's in your exact industry, your exact specialization, that's the exact role you want, it's very, very, very low. So if you set your, 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 your mindset to be, 
my first job's not going to be perfect. My second job probably, probably isn't going to be perfect either. But it's leading up to me finding my perfect career third or fourth job. It shifts what you're looking for. And that's a big thing, I think, for a lot of people entering the industry, any industry, is that you have everyone who just gone through school with you. You have all the people who got laid off in last round of layoffs. And you have all the new Canadians who are coming in as well. And everyone's very talented. There's a sh- the amount of talent. There. It's shocking. It- it's crazy. So it's, is it worth you firing off your resume to thousands of places, some of which you're not even qualified for? No, because everyone's using AI in that to screen the first round. Not everyone, lots of big companies do. So if you, you don't have like, that's what they're yeah. looking for, you're not going to get a callback from them anyway. So why waste your time sending out thousands? Sure. Control what you can control. You can control your time and how you present yourself. So just take the time. And that's why it's so important to start doing the networking now and exploring all the different subsets of careers and jobs that exist because there are so many. I learn about a new job almost every month. It's yeah. crazy. I've been doing this a long time. I've been in careers and like adjacent careers for like over a decade. And I'm still finding about new jobs. Like what the hell is that thing? And it's not like this is a new job that's just been created because of a new technology. This is like some thing that's been around for, you know, millennia. And I just didn't know because it's so outside what I do on a day to day. So, um, you know, get out there, try and find, you know, if you find someone who does something you really like, you think it's super cool, have that meeting, talk to them about what their journey was to get there. Because I guarantee you, it wasn't a straight Mm -hmm. path. Mine certainly wasn't. I ended up, I went from scientists to running an agency. That's not a straight path. Um, So talk to them, find out what they did, hear what's going on. And then as you sort of figure out what that job's going to be, work very backwards. You know, maybe you take a job that's in, and maybe you want to be on the cutting edge of virology, yeah. which is amazing. I love all of that stuff. That's what I wanted to do as a kid as well. Working at level four hot zone was where I wanted to be. Mm. As a weird kid, I also wanted to be a food food researcher too, which I guess I kind of have become. But, um, you know, it's kind of, as you go through it, so, you know, you're not going to start in a level four hot zone. So maybe you have to go and work at a pharmacy doing, you know, inventory. You know what? That's cool. Because then you start to understand the drugs and you have access to talking to the pharmacist about it, talking about drug interactions and why you might not want to prescribe this drug with that viral infection versus this one and you use that knowledge to then go and take the next job that gets you to working in the pharmaceutical company not in virology yet but you get Mm -hmm. you just slowly work your way up there and so you know i think that we're all so panicked and rushed especially when we were younger to find that and you said it yourself like find that job to get the thing just get (laughs) calm down slow down you know i think we're we're all so rushed to go and find that dream job but the reality i think we're all sold a very false dream that 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 dream job is the first thing we're going to get. And the reality is, it is for a micro percentage. But for most of us, you're going to go through two, three, four jobs, and then you're going to be like, oh my goodness, I love this. Or you'll get to that point and be like, you know what? I've hated all of this. And you're going to switch careers or you go off and launch your own thing or who knows. But think of it as a journey, not as the end goal. And you'll take, you'll take a ton of stress off yourself. And and don't be ashamed to reach out for help. Don't be don't think it think of it as a negative if you have to go and take a job at Starbucks or McDonald's because you just got to mm-hmm. people you got to eat, dude. You know I've I've worked Starbucks. Kidding me? I've definitely been a barista. You know I've done door to door sales. I've planted trees. I as a lifeguard. I worked in the science lab at a high school. I was an assistant teacher for high. School. Like I've done some bizarre, wacky jobs in my life, but every single one has contributed to me getting here. So, you know, it's, it's discouraging when you don't get right to what you want, but I think it's really important that you recognize and everyone recognize it's just your first step. Just the first step. There's so many more to come. So don't let the, the stumbles up front discourage you. There's so many more things are ahead of you. You just got to push through it. Well, I'm going to leave it there. You've said so many amazing things. I wanted to talk about other things as well, but I just couldn't stop. Like I had to list to get that message out there because I think that Maybe maybe I personally just needed it because I was here was me yesterday. Like I'm I'm like I'm I'm a failure because I I've been taking too long to do this PhD, which I'm not I'm I'm not even. But somehow, you know, we tell ourselves we're a failure, even though really it doesn't make any sense in in some regards. So goes to show having a good support system also definitely helps. But thank you so much, Jared, for coming on the show. Great advice that I think students need to hear and young people because things are uncertain, but. That just means there's a lot of opportunity as well. So we got to take it where we can. For sure. So, so much opportunity. And uh, always happy to come back and chat about all the other things we wanted to talk about, uh, which are much more food related. Always happy to come back and chat. If you or any of our listeners ever want to reach out and talk about anything you've talked about or just need someone to listen to them about their story and what's going on, you can find me on LinkedIn very easily. I live and breathe on that platform. It's the only social media I like and I'm on. I'm consistently, and if you're really clever, if you dig through my profile, you'll even find the Calendly link. 
that will allow you to book a meeting with me. And by all means, I encourage you to do so. It is there. You have to dig for it a little bit. Although I think I have a post coming out either later this week or next. I think it's actually later this week that actually says, hey, I want everyone to reach out to me. Come and say hi. I'd love to talk. But I think the link's in there too, but it's definitely my profile. But I, yeah, I'd love to talk to everyone. So if you want to talk about anything we talk about, careers, food, marketing, CPG, retail, <laughs> reach out. Love to chat. Amazing. Thank you so much, Jared. That was episode 63 of the Food Grads podcast. All the notes to this podcast can be found by clicking on the Student and Grads tab on the Food Grads website. There you can find any notes to past or future episodes. I encourage you to check out that tab because we have just redesigned our podcast page. It looks so much better. So amazing to have a lot of great people on the team working on that. Um, Shout out to Papatar and making it work. Okay. Was that not a great episode with Jared? I reached out to Jared when he made a post on LinkedIn where he put out a message saying that he wanted to be on some podcasts. With him being in the consumer packaged goods space, I thought it would be perfect to have him on the show. We sat down prior to the show, I sat with my prepared list of questions, and the episode didn't really cover much of them. But while I was recording, I thought, forget these questions, this is way better. This is great advice. It sounds as though Jared has experienced a lot of lived experience, so it comes from this place that is very genuine. Dealing with the uncertainties of the future can be difficult, especially when it seems like everything is changing every day. It, it, it can be scary. <laughs> it really can. So one thing that is for sure, though, is that people do need to eat. So the food industry sounds like a pretty stable industry to go to. So build your network and you never know what job might be out there for you. Of course, I have to do a self plug in. Check out the Food Grads website. We are updating our careers page. So you're going to see some more exciting stuff coming up on the website. And if you haven't already, follow Jared on LinkedIn. He puts out a lot of great informational posts about marketing, small businesses, CPG brands. He, he just covers a lot of it. Really good stuff. You won't be disappointed. Well, that's it for this week's episode. Thank you everyone so much for listening and I will see you next time.